In 1977, NASA took advantage of a rare planetary alignment and launched two probes into space that massively expanded our understanding of this solar system. Nearly 45 years later, the Voyager probes are still sending invaluable data back to Earth. Now they have crossed into interstellar space, where they have become humankind's most distant ambassadors. It's a real privilege to be talking about NASA's Voyager mission with Dr. Alan Cummings, senior scientist and member of the professional staff at Caltech, Todd Barber, a propulsion engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and Stella Auker, a graduate student at Cornell University. Our pleasure. Here. Delighted to be here, Becky. Well, it's really hard to know even where to dive in on a mission like this. It's obviously incredibly influential and inspirational to science and the public alike. So I just thought uh, we, we could start by an overview of this grand tour that the Voyager probes have been doing uh, uh, in the solar system, why that alignment was so important and how long they've been out there exploring space and now the interstellar frontier. Okay, I could start with that. So there were two Voyager missions, two Voyager spacecraft. Uh, Voyager 2 was actually launched first on August 20th, 1977. And Voyager 1 was launched second on September the 5th. And they decided to name the one that got to Jupiter, Voyager 1, who got to Jupiter first, Voyager 1. So that's why it was on a faster trajectory and it passed Voyager 2 on the way. So they, the idea was to get to, uh, first idea was just to get to Jupiter and Saturn. It was usually, it was called MJS, Mariner Jupiter Saturn, until almost to launch. Alan, I also wanted to ask, you know, you've been on this mission since before it launched. Could you could you talk a little bit about the origins of this uh, mission? Okay, so this actually goes back to 1965. There was a graduate student at Caltech named Gary Flandro, and he was working in the summer over at JPL, and he was they were working on, uh, you know, how to be more efficient in this interplanetary uh, missions and, you know, getting some gravitational assists from one planet to the next and so forth. And he discovered this alignment that um, he said, wow, you know, coming up in a few years, well, it was 1977 is when they finally launched, but uh, that all the major planets would be on the same side. We could, you could bounce off of one, go to the next and go to the next and go to this, and this isn't gonna happen again for 176 years, so better take advantage of it, and NASA did. I'd just love to know, you know, given the, how influential it is, and it's almost a half century now, uh, what was the mood and atmosphere amongst your colleagues? I actually was at the Cape before each launch, right before each launch. In fact, I was the last person to touch the spacecraft before they got launched. Wow. This hand right here. It had a glove on it. But <laughs> Todd, I'm wondering when you first became aware of Voyager and what the mission kind of meant to you as you got interested in space science. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I love this rare planetary alignment too, that, uh, you know, they, I think they told Nixon about it and said, now look, in 1977, the, the four gas giant planets are aligning up. And so the last time this happened, this only happens every 176 years. So it was 1801 and Jefferson blew it. Don't make the same mistake. <laughs> so Nixon said, let's do two. You know, maybe that was what he was meant instead of I'm not a crook. But to Nixon's credit, uh, we got the Voyager funded there. The first seven years of my career, I was a propulsion engineer on the Galileo mission to Jupiter, which was the first Jupiter orbiter. And then I was uh, 21 years on Cassini. And for about 15 of those, I was the head propulsion engineer on Cassini, which was the first Saturn orbiter. So I thought my career had uh, come full circle just working those first two orbital missions. But then, Right as Cassini was uh, getting ready to plunge into Saturn, there were Voyager thruster issues. I promised I didn't sabotage Voyager, but they, they came calling. I dealt with some of the same issues on Cassini. And I have to say, it's the most challenging engineering I've done in my entire career, uh, just keeping these two geriatric spacecraft flying and trying to bring all the great science to Alan and Stella and the rest of the science team. It's an absolute honor and thrill of my lifetime. Yeah, and it's interesting you hear you go through um, Galileo and Cassini, and it shows just the evolution of all, all these interesting missions, even as Voyager just keeps on going. And um, to that point, Stella, I'd love to hear how you first got interested in the mission or what your first impressions were of Voyager and how that played into your choice to, to uh, pursue science as well. So I was born in the 90s. So I think when I was born, Voyager 
Alan and Todd can correct me if I'm wrong here, but it was somewhere between Neptune and the termination shock. And it was transitioning into being an interstellar mission. And so I was not aware of Voyager explicitly, I think until college, but the golden record had been a part of my cultural psyche for as long as I could remember. And then when I got to graduate school at Cornell, I started to become really interested in the interstellar medium. And I decided that that would be the focus of my scientific research. And my advisor pointed me to this really interesting study that had been done with Voyager. And it suddenly opened my eyes to the fact that Voyager was extremely unique and that it was the only probe we have directly sampling the interstellar medium. And after that, it was it was like, I have to work with Voyager. Yeah, and I have to ask too, given that um, it was launched in the, in the 70s and designed at that period, could, we, could you elaborate a little bit about the instrumentation that's on it? I mean, how far uh, advanced have we come since Voyager was launched? And, and is it able to still, like, how is it able to still make such good uh, detections and observations given that technology has really advanced a lot since, since the 70s? Maybe, Alan, you can uh, grab okay. that. Okay, yeah. Uh, well, it has three computers, and I think they have 70K of memory on them. It's like your iPhone is billions of times more powerful than the computers on Voyager. I mean, you know, this was early on, and there's hardly any computers at all. Um, it is amazing what they do with the limited amount of programming that went on. It's, it's astounding. What are some of the most awe-inspiring moments or discoveries that Voyager, uh, that the probes have, have uh, managed to accomplish that uh, really stuck out to you that are the kind of big, personal uh, awe-inspiring moments for you in this mission. Ed Stone always said, you can only explore the solar system uh, for the first time once. And that was the absolute beauty of this mission, even just on the planetary side, is seeing these dozens and dozens of worlds that had only been seen as points of light for all of humanity. And to see them as actual worlds was amazing. This is maybe seems less exciting, you know, compared to the first image of Triton or the first image of Io. But for me personally, like my most exciting moment so far was the first time that I downloaded Voyager data and I actually plotted it through my own program and realized that I was actually analyzing data from the spacecraft myself directly. That was like just an, such an exciting moment. And finding something new and exciting gives me chills right now. <laughs> what you did there. Yeah. Before we leave the solar system, because I, I can tell Alan and Stella you want to get into the interstellar medium in particular. <laughs> but um, I think one of the things that has been so, uh, has been such a paradigm shift is uh, the look back at Earth, the pale blue dot um, uh, image uh, that has become very famous as this, you know, example of how small our planet is in the scheme of things. Um, so Voyager is obviously showing us these new amazing planets and moons, as, as Alan you know, mentioned there, but also a new view of our own planet. Um, what, is that, what does that particular picture and images of Earth from these distant um, probes mean to you? And I love you, all of your reads on that. I think, you know, Carl Sagan lobbied for that photo to be taken and they turned the cameras back on. It was in February 14th, 1990, I believe. And um, he's written a book about it. He's had, I've got YouTube videos and I've used them in my talks and so forth, but I think he had it right, which was, it's just a tiny mote of dust in the vastness of the cosmos. And we're just <laughs> so insignificant really. And why are we fighting over one little corner of this pixel and another corner of the pixel? As Rodney King said, why can't we just all get along? I mean, it seems that's the message I got really from the picture. Sure. I remember seeing that shot as well. It was uh, taken just shortly before I started my career at JPL. And of course, I read Carl's book, Pale Blue Dot, where that term comes from. But uh, one thing that others have said about that image and also the Apollo 8 image of the Earth is the picture that launched a thousand environmentalists. So how precious and careful we have to be with this gorgeous home planet we call home. 
That's one of the things that I appreciate so much about the Voyager mission was that there was a real attention to the social and cultural impact that a scientific mission can have and how a mission can be more than just scientific discovery. It can also mean something to us as a society and as a species. Yeah, I I agree. And I think that as it goes further into the interstellar medium, that is something that has also really captured the public's imagination to think that uh, such a distant frontier is being explored. Todd, you had mentioned too um, the challenges of driving these spacecraft as as the propulsion engineer on this. Um, What are some of those challenges? What's it like to be out there in interstellar space and actually driving these spacecraft? Oh, how much time do you have? (laughs) You have two 44-year-old spacecraft, and thank goodness for all the redundant systems. Um, So where to start? Let's see, we're low on power. uh, Mm -hmm. We lose about four watts a year, so we know in some number of years we just won't have enough power to power the spacecraft. The radio signal's getting very weak, so we actually had to beef up the deep space network antennas just to pull off the Neptune encounter in 1989. We had to Mm -hmm. uh, make those dishes larger. Um, we have propellant lines that are about to freeze. I tell people it's it's like Apollo 13. It's not as intense, uh, thank goodness, but it's spread out over years instead of a few hours uh, just because of all these super engineering challenges. So all of these propulsion systems are still working and, uh, and, and having these interesting redundancies that you guys are able to keep the mission going on. Um, The instruments are also still gathering data, which is amazing. And and I wanted to ask Stella, you had this recent paper in Nature Astronomy that um, that, uh, actually mapped like waves in the interstellar plasma uh, that was, uh, that used one of these instruments that I, I don't think was originally maybe optimized for that purpose. Yeah, yeah, so in this research, we were using what's called the plasma wave system or PWS on Voyager. And the plasma wave system was originally designed to study plasma wave phenomena in the uh, magnetospheres of the outer planets. And by the time Voyager got to the interstellar medium, the plasma wave system was actually the only tool operating on Voyager 1 that we could use to infer the density of the plasma in interstellar space. Um, And this was partially because the instrument that had originally been designed to study the density of the plasma, um, which was called the plasma science experiment, I believe, um, actually failed on Voyager 1. And so the plasma wave system ended up picking up the the reins, so to speak, on studying the density. And the way that it did this was by detecting plasma oscillations, which are essentially uh, when the plasma, which is essentially just ionized gas, it's a collection of electrons and protons, when the plasma gets disturbed by something like a shock wave that comes outwards from the sun, the plasma essentially vibrates in response to that disturbance. And then the plasma wave system can detect these plasma oscillations as they're called. So it's not only uh, designed to do all these things and keeps living up to that, but there's these surprise discoveries as well that Voyager continues to do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, well, to that point, you know, uh, you mentioned it's getting a little rickety. Um, Alan, could you tell us where the two probes are, how far they are from from Earth right now, and how long you expect them to continue talking to us and and working? So Voyager 1 is 154 AU. I think the light travel time is about 21 hours, 22 minutes or something. Voyager 2 is about 128, uh, 27, I think, AU, or 28. As I said, they're pretty far apart, though. They're, They're in the general direction of space, but I think they're like 160 AU apart, something like that. But we, as Todd said earlier, we need four watts per year, and four watts was about what the heater was, and instruments, something like four watts. So we're going to get to the point pretty soon in the next few years where uh, one instrument will have to just be turned off, and then next year another one will have to be turned off. That may happen as early as 2024, 2025, something like that. Uh, for the bigger instruments like our instrument and LACP, smaller instruments can last longer. 
they don't uh, use as much power. I would guess, maybe Todd knows better, that, that basically this is all being worked. A lot of different scenarios are being considered about the order and how long things get going and what risk they take on the engineering side. Um, I would say the last gasp of just engineering data might be in 2020, 30, 2031, something like that. Todd, you could correct me if you think differently. Yeah, if, if we're very lucky and if nothing else goes wrong, then that, that might be an outside chance of getting getting that late. And uh, Alan's exactly right. It's Sophie's choice in the, 20s, 20, in the 2020s. So first we turn off these survival heaters one by one. So far we're 100% if you add up both spacecraft um, and they, we put them many tens of degrees C below anything they ever saw in qualification or in flight. And yet all the instruments, you know, once they're recalibrated, continued working. So again, I would never bet against Voyager. At some point though, we run out of all these heaters to turn off. So we actually have to do that very difficult decision of turning off science instruments. It's really bittersweet to imagine that because it, it is like slowly uh, getting a little darker and darker until we have that final last dispatch. But I think the comfort or one of the comforts is uh, this amazing uh, Voyager golden record. Uh, you know, speaking so much about what this, this mission means to the public, uh, having this time capsule on there with all of these mementos of Earth and human life, I, I just think it's such a beautiful idea. And I wanted to ask each of you if there's anything in particular on the record that you are you are you're heartwarmed by that that will be going into interstellar space and beyond the solar system eventually. Alan, let's start with you. Okay. Well, you know, there was quite a controversy about that golden record. There were. Really? This was another thing that Carl Sagan, I think, pushed. Uh, and there were probably experimenters wondering, well, maybe I could use those extra grams or something, you know? And what was it really gonna do anyway? But I, I think it's just a fantastic thing, actually. It's, those spacecraft are gonna be our ambassadors, silent ambassadors, I think is what Ed Stone said once, into the galaxy. They're gonna go forever. They're gonna go billions of years, long before, you know, we'll be gone. and. Planet Earth will probably be gone, but it's probably not going to hit anything. Um, it takes about 226 million years to go around the center of the galaxy once. It should go many times. Um, but my personal favorite on the gold, and of course the golden record has on its cover there the directions to how to find us for the aliens. That I thought that might be a mistake, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I said, well, maybe we do need that border wall, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Keep the aliens out. Uh, but the song that I thought was really cool to put on there was uh, by Chuck Berry. I think it's Johnny B. Good. I thought, wow, that's something. <laughs> they put that on there. Aliens will really like that one, I think. <laughs> that's right. Stella, what about you? I think the the recordings of greetings from the around the world to space was very moving to me to hear different cultures ways of positioning themselves in the cosmos you know because how you choose to write that greeting says something about your culture and the way that you view your place in the universe and when you listen to them you definitely start to see a kind of universality in the way that humanity thinks about its place on Earth and its place in the galaxy. And that's kind of beautiful. What about you, Todd? Yeah, you know, I have to say, I, I am enamored with the Golden Record. And there's a beautiful book called Murmurs of Earth. It's maybe out of print, but you can find it on how they picked all the greetings, languages, sounds, and pictures on the record. They had five weeks to put it together. A guy named Tim Ferriss produced the record. He said, I, you know, I, I made exactly I got in the record biz, I sold exactly two copies, both run ceremoniously, jettisoned in the universe for all eternity, so I got out of the music biz. But I think Carl Sagan's hidden agenda was world peace. And that's my favorite part of the record is 55 languages and greetings of peace. And it, it, it wasn't one nation sending something out into the cosmic ocean, it was humanity doing that. And I, I just absolutely love it. Um, the Beatles turned down the chance to be on the record. That's kind of cool. We get to keep the Beatles for ourselves here on Earth, too. But, <laughs> you know, as far as the directions, I always say it's true. We've we've given them roadmap to billions of tasty, edible humans, but it's a long, awful long way to go for takeouts.